Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Anam Akul, with you at BTV World. In today's show, we will be taking a look at the U.S. President Joe Biden's first visit to Israel and the declarations that have been made as a part of this particular declaration. And of course, what is being called the Jerusalem Declaration was specifically with regards to Iran as well and its nuclear program. The joint pledge uh, that has been declared between Israel and the U.S. refers to uh, using all sorts of measures to uh, deprive Iran um, of the fact that uh, this is something, of course, that is uh, going to be uh, not uh, happening in the near future and that is going to be uh, curtailed by the Western powers, including the U.S. and Israel as well. Um, we will be also taking a look um, at what that means in terms of the relationship that is going to be evolving uh, now even further between Israel and the U.S. Um, and then, of course, how this is going to impact the way moving forward uh, regarding the Iranian nuclear deal earlier, uh, which we saw, of course, the U.S. backing out from, whether or not uh, we're going to be seeing the sort of statement that has come in from the Israeli Prime Minister uh, regarding Iran's uh, actions when it is uh, put under pressure and when there is a lot of uh, use of force or the threat of the use of force that exists is when um, Iran actually bows down. This is what is the crux of the statements made uh, by the Israeli Prime Minister. Whether or not that is going to be true since, of course, the country is already under heavy sanctions um, and has uh, repeatedly claimed that there is no uh, nuclear weapons that are being uh, developed within its territory. So we're going to take a look at that. And then, of course, we're also going to be focusing on Joe Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia as well, um, and then trying to understand how this particular pledge between the U.S. and Israel uh, is going to be taken in in terms of its relationship with Saudi Arabia um, and, of course, Saudi Arabia's own relationships with Iran. Uh, we're also going to be taking a look at whether or not uh, this can pave the way of any sort of rapprochement uh, between the uh, between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Israel as well. So we're going to be taking an overall look at all of these relationships and what it means um, with each respective country. For this and more, as usual in the studios, I've been joined by Farouk Badafi and Raja Faisal. Um, and we're also going to be uh, joined uh, by uh, uh, our guests online as well. And for now, we've been joined on Skype by Scott Lucas. Thank you very much, Scott, for joining us uh, and being a part of the debate. Uh, and hopefully we'll be joined uh, very soon uh, by another guest on telephone line. Um, Scott, I'll start with you when we look at uh, Joe Biden's uh, travels to the Middle East and then, of course, uh, the kind of statements that have come out from this preliminary visit. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of talk going on regarding the Jerusalem Declaration and what that means in terms of a renewed commitment uh, between Israel and the U.S. Um, against uh, stopping Iran from developing nuclear weapons. Um, what do you make of this particular pledge, uh, what it means exactly in terms of actual actions that can or may be taken in the future uh, by both these countries against Iran, and how it's going to impact the Iranian nuclear deal? Let's work with rhetoric and reality. The rhetoric of the Jerusalem Declaration, is, it, it's a lot of words you would expect on how the U.S. is committed to Israeli security, something that the U.S. has said for decades. It talks about both countries being concerned about the Iranian nuclear threat and pledging that Iran will never have a nuclear weapon. That you would expect as well. But the reality is, is that there is sort of a, a, a difference of approach between the two countries and then a convergence. Hmm. The difference of approach, at least publicly, is that as Biden made clear, U.S. still wants to see a diplomatic path. In other words, in an ideal world, they would like to see a nuclear agreement with the Iranians, although those talks are stalled. The Israelis, at least publicly, keep talking about the fact that they'll put an emphasis on coercion. They'll put an emphasis on the need of military deterrence of the Iranians. So you'll still have that difference in, in, in approach to an extent. But where they converge is, is that if the talks continue to be stalled, and they are stalled not because of one side or the other, they're stalled both because of Iran and the U.S. and also the other powers who are worried about Tehran, if those talks are still stalled, there will be pressure on Iran economically through the sanctions, we know that, and there will be pressure through the covert operations which the Israelis are pursuing, what they've called basically the octopus doctrine. You know, the Israelis are carrying out assassinations, they're carrying out sabotage operations, and while the U.S. will not publicly support those, they're certainly not going to do anything to stop them. So it's that ongoing pressure on Tehran 
unless and until we get some movement forward in which Iran gives up part of its nuclear program in exchange for the lifting of U.S. sanctions. Right. So uh, when we when we take a look at what has been stated in terms of um, every sort of measure being taken or uh, the U.S. Uh, not shying away from any last resort action, what does that really mean? Is that pointing towards the possibility of any military action maybe sometime far in the future? But even so. No, I, I, I don't think we're looking at military action. I mean, in the sense that the Americans would back an Israeli open operation on Iranian nuclear facilities. They'll support covert operations, but not overt. You may recall that in recent years during the Trump administration, the closest we've got to a military confrontation comes, for example, when the Iranians up the ante, when, for example, they attack shipping in the Persian Gulf and when they carry out drone operations, such as the attacks using the Houthis on Saudi Arabian facilities, such as the Iranian attacks on U.S. personnel on Iraqi bases. If Iran does not carry out those attacks, in other words, if it doesn't give the U.S. an excuse to retaliate with overt action, we're not going to see that. In other words, we're going to be working in this gray area in which the Iranians will thump their chest, they'll talk about their drones, they'll talk about their ships, but the gray area is going to be that their nuclear facilities are going to continue to be under pressure from Israeli operations and the Americans are going to say to the Iranians, look, you have got to accept the fact that the Revolutionary Guards have got to pull back in the Middle East. We're not going to give you a deal which allows them carte blanche. And you are going to have to limit your Iranian enrichment that you've been expanding in the past two years. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me also welcome in the debate uh, Mr. Fahim Alhamid, who's a strategist, and he is going to be uh, talking about uh, the U.S. Saudi Arabia relationship as well, and he specializes in the conflict zone. Thank you very much, uh, Fahim Alhamid, for being with us in the debate. Uh, when we take a look at what has happened uh, in, in terms of uh, Joe Biden, and of course, the Israeli Prime Minister taking forward this pledge against the nuclear development program of Iran, and whether or not uh, there may be any weapons and to, in order to curtail that, uh, any sort of measure can be taken uh, with regards to doing that. Uh, how do you think Saudi Arabia is going to be perceiving uh, this pledge and whether or not uh, the way that the U.S. and Israel are moving forward in terms of their stance against Iran uh, will pave way for any warming of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia? Hello? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. All right. Um, uh, welcome to the debate. My question to you is uh, with regards to uh, President Joe Biden's uh, statement, the joint declaration that has come in uh, with regards to a pledge between U.S. and Israel regarding uh, the nuclear weapons development in Iran and how to curtail that. How do you think this is going to be perceived in Saudi Arabia? What is Saudi Arabia's stance on this? And whether or not this renewed commitment between U.S. and Israel is going to pave the way for any warming of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia? Well, let me first of all uh, say that when Biden administration and his decision-making team in the White House traveled to Saudi Arabia, this reflects the strength of Saudi Arabia in the international arena. Saudi Arabia has uh, invited the kingdom, the king of Saudi Arabia, the custodian of two holy mosques, has invited President Biden to visit Saudi Arabia to listen from him directly on certain issues which is very much affecting Saudi Arabia. One of the most important issues is the hostile approach of the Iranian regime towards the Gulf countries and Arab countries, and the proxy war which Iran has, uh, you know, moved against Saudi Arabia and important, uh, important countries like Yemen, Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria. So when President Biden visits Saudi Arabia, it will be a very unique chance to listen directly from the president about his approach towards the uh, Iranian nuclear fight towards how the American policy will move to deal with this uh, file, which is very much a threat 
to the region and Saudi Arabia. And also, uh, we would like to know and hear that how much uh, the President Biden uh, administration uh, approach towards the Palestinian issue and Palestinian state and Al-Quds as the capital of Palestinian states and how the Palestinian can regain their legitimate, uh, you know, authority uh, on the state of, 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 of Palestine. So, at the same time, Saudi Arabia right, would uh, just, stress just to clarify, does on this mean that uh, reviving, reviving the Saudi-American strategic approach and to work together to have peace and stability in the region. Right. Does this mean that uh, Saudi Arabia welcomes a joint pledge between the U.S. and Israel? Yes, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Fahim Al Hamid. Uh, you know, I have a question related to uh, obviously this yes, visit. Can, you raise can your we? Voice, please? Yes, carry Sorry. on, Fahim. Yeah. Uh, can we can we consider this visit important because right now uh, a crisis uh, of Ukraine crisis that is affecting Europe and the West? Uh, can we take it in that context as well that the energy crisis of the Europe? can be fulfilled by the Gulf states and of course Gulf states are needed uh, needed to uh, increase their uh, production the Gulf, uh, you know the oil production uh, brother this is very very important question certainly 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 you know one of the main item from the point of view of United States will be that the American administration, will be seeking the support from the Saudi administration to increase the oil production. However, I would like to, you know, speak on a certain point that is very important to the Pakistani viewers and listeners to know that, you know, any increase in, 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 uh, in OPEC production, it has to go through OPEC Plus. You know, OPEC Plus, is different than OPEC. OPEC plus, they are the authority country who are from OPEC and from outside OPEC. I would like to mention that Saudi Arabia has increased once the, 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 uh, the, the production with coordination with OPEC plus members when, unite, uh, when, uh, when, when the European countries has make embargo on oil on Russia. So with the consultation of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has raised the production. So the matter of raising production is not unilaterally uh, by Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, if they made the request, they will put it to OPEC Plus. And now it will depend on the you know, supply and demand and the, the, the international market. Does it uh, require such increase? What will be the impact? You know. You know, uh, today the price of one, one gasoline lit, uh, liter in the United <coughs> States is $5, which is very, very high. And American administration, they are, you know, affected uh, very much in the light of the midterm election. So we yeah, understand, yes, brother, how much right. Americans, they are suffering. But at least, you know, it is time, brother, that, you know, we should deal. <laughs> With the United right, States. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Fahim, please stay on the line with us. Yes, right, please stay with us. Uh, yeah. With your yes. permission, I wanted to take the question to uh, Professor Lucas. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor, uh, uh, when uh, President Biden actually ran uh, during his campaign, he took a very hard stance on uh, uh, one, he took a hard stance uh, regarding uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, after even coming to power, he actually had the similar kind of muscular posture. And regarding Israel also, we saw that uh, regarding Netanyahu, they were less uh, uh, flexible. But now it seems that something has changed. Is it only because of the energy crisis and because of Ukraine? Or something else is also playing behind the scenes? I ask this because, uh, A, on one side, it seems that P, uh, P5 plus 1 are no longer united, who were actually touching the subject of uh, uh, renegotiating with Iran. And Iran seems to have uh, a confrontationist uh, regime, a uh, harder uh, uh, regime. 
So is it because of that as well or something else has gone on? Well, it's a great question. And I think building on what our Saudi friend has said, there are three issues in which here's the fundamental. The Americans don't have leverage and the Saudis do, which is different from the way we usually think about America trying to run the Middle East. Issue one, we're discussed it already, containing Iran. If the emphasis in Washington is to contain Iran, working with the Israelis, if you don't believe a nuclear deal is possible, then Saudi Arabia is part of that containment of Iran, and that gives them leverage on what they want, including, by the way, arms from the United States to the uh, oil issue. Since we're looking at a protracted war in Ukraine, I do not think Vladimir Putin will end his invasion, even though the Russians are in trouble for months. Then you're going to have to be talking about rearranging these energy supplies. And the Saudis quite clearly have leverage there, which means, and sources are saying they will probably agree to increase production and announce it in September, but there will be a price for that. Third issue is the convergence between Israel and Saudi. Uh, a public signal today, the Saudis are going to allow overflights by Israel, the first time in recent history. But behind the scenes, a lot more economic cooperation, cooperation on technological issues, and cooperation on issues such as Iran. Now, what is the price on those three issues that the Americans have to pay? You stop calling for accountability over the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, which was probably ordered by the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. You no longer raise that as an issue. In fact, you no longer, beyond rhetoric, really talk about human rights issues in Saudi Arabia, including detentions and political prisoners. Those issues now are pushed away. In other words, we're talking now not about idealism and values. We're talking about power politics. And the Americans simply, if they continue to think we have to contain Iran, and if the Ukraine war continues, they are in a weak position where it's the Saudis who get to basically set the agenda on what they want. Yeah, uh, Professor Scott, you know, if we talk about Iran, uh, a couple of days ago, there was a news. It said that Iran uh, plans to supply, uh, you know, combat drones to Russia for obviously Ukraine. They can use it against uh, Ukraine. Can we say that this, it, this can be considered as an active participation of Iran in Ukraine crisis? At the same time, maybe uh, the Western powers, they are looking for uh, another active participation from the Gulf side for Ukraine against Russia? Oh, I mean, it, it's absolutely, you know, an indication that Iran is possibly giving military aid to Russia, including drones. And the Russians badly need drones because it's one reason why they have fared so poorly in terms of uh, their campaigns. The, their artillery needs drones to function more effectively. But there's a wider issue here, a story, if you'll know. The Israelis knocked out a major drone factory inside Iran uh, just a few months ago. So they crippled Iranian drone production. So what do the Iranians do? They open up a drone factory in Tajikistan because the Israelis aren't going to hit Tajikistan without causing a serious diplomatic incident. So the Iranians are looking in their rhetoric to say, look, you know, you may try to attack us, but we're still tough. We're going to come after you. They've talked in the last 24 hours about drones at sea. And secondly, in a very real sense, yes, they're going to try to flex their military muscles. And if they're feeling under pressure from Israel, um, and if the nuclear talks are stalled, yeah, I do foresee that they will be giving more aid to the Russians, yeah, which will Professor just make Scott, matters even more Professor tense. Scott, uh, Professor Scott, very quickly, can we say that Iranians are looking for S-400s from Russia in return of, uh, obviously, this help? And by the way, if uh, two highly uh, sanctioned countries cooperate, what can the world do about it? Well, the first thing is, is that, you know, I, I don't think Iranians will be looking for S-400s necessarily immediately. Um, that, you know, they, they do have air defenses right now. And I don't, again, I don't think we're talking about an imminent Israeli overt strike. Uh, the Iranian worry is, is that they can't defend against the covert operations, which is why the head of their intelligence for the Revolutionary Guards was sacked a few weeks ago. Uh, the Iranians also would like some type of economic help because they are in a serious economic crisis. But here's the, here's the issue. Uh, where I think the Iranians and the Russians are in serious trouble is on the economic front. 
yeah. the combination of sanctions on Russia and the combination of sanctions on Iran, as well as long-term difficulties within those countries, means they are relatively isolated. Uh, right, absolutely. The, um, what, uh, Mr. Hamid, when we talk about this, uh, we, we have seen in the statements that have come out as well, uh, is that uh, the isolation and this increase in sanctions uh, or putting more pressure on Iran seems to be part of the tactic as well and seems to be the option on the table as well. Uh, even so that the Israeli prime minister spoke about how uh, this is the way that Iran uh, usually acts or is forced to act when it is under a lot of pressure or uh, when uh, it understands that the use of force or the threat of use of force is real. Um, how do you uh, how do you look at this particular statement, considering the fact that uh, we have seen so far, um, despite increasing sanctions on Iran, uh, that there has been resistance uh, from the Iranian leadership, that there hasn't been any uh, way that they have actually succumbed to the Iranian nuclear deal or acting in a way uh, that the U.S. or Israel wanted to? Is this question addressed to me? Yes. Yes, it is. Can you repeat it briefly, please? Right. Uh, my question was uh, with regards to uh, the way that we have seen that there has been increasing pressure on Iran. There has been increasing sanctions in the past as well. Um, and yet we have seen resistance coming in from the Iranian leadership, something which perhaps uh, uh, the U.S. administration and the Israeli prime minister disagree in terms of that being a viable option. They say that increasing isolation, increasing sanctions is still something on the table and may be used. And that this is actually the way that Iran uh, comes around when it realizes that there is going to be use of force or that the threat of force is real. So if there's a lot of pressure, then Iran will do uh, what the U.S. and the Israel and other countries want it to do. However, we haven't really seen that happening in the past. What do you make of this statement, whether or not you agree as uh, this strategy being viable? Any comment on what Israeli Prime Minister said? However, uh, as, as, as you know, a strategist in this part of the world, uh, we consider, uh, you know, Israeli, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the Middle East should be free from all uh, nuclear, nuclearization. We should not give any exception to any country who to nuclearize the Middle East. Right, no, At I understand meantime, that. My question is, having... how do you think that you're going to make Iran do that or actually stop uh, in, in well you know you know uh, you know that's why the, the president of united states coming to saudi arabia saudi leader going to discuss with the president biden how, what is his vision towards you know containing iran ambition to have a nuclear bomb Okay, and I how, understand that, but what is how Saudi much Arabia's current minimize... stance on how to curtail the development of Iranian nuclear weapons? How, what is the Saudi Arabian perspective on this? On what? On what is the way forward in stopping the uh, nuclearization of Middle East, of Iran, of uh, stopping Iran from developing nuclear weapons? Well, you know, uh, uh, first of all, let me tell you, there is an is a, 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 there is a, a, a nuclear um, the file of the new um, uh, Iranian nuclear, which United States uh, uh, has embarked on negotiation uh, uh, in during the Trump administration, and uh, then the Biden administration comes and they have revoked that agreement. So okay. what we are requesting that. The basic agreement should be implemented, and Iran should not be giving a safe passage to sell their petroleum from outside and gain money from that uh, petroleum illegal and build its nuclear issue, a nuclear pile. So that's why I'm telling you again and again, okay. when President Biden uh, comes to Fahim, Saudi Arabia, uh, one second, there will be a wide one thing. Uh, Mr. Fahim, can you just answer whether or not you think that increasing issue. isolation and increasing sanctions are in Iran is the right answer moving forward? You know, increasing the sanction, we have seen the sanctions. The sanction, in fact, did not help because mm. there is a lot of violation from Iranian regime, they are selling behind the scene oil and getting the money. So we need some understanding clear 
because you know what we are thinking to deal with the issue uh, regionally how can we contain iran how can we find solution to yemen and how we can bring peace to the region yeah all right Br- brother fahim brother fahim you have highlighted one of the points that if uh, iran obviously is de-sanctioned or the sanctions are uh, uh, you know uh, sort of uh, lesser sanctions on iran then they might start selling their oil and earning money and start building start building uh, you know new they are doing once again. it now yeah so this this is the one reason can we say the other reason is that as uh, you know saudi arabia is the key player of the region and saudi arabia uh, sees iran as an investor and facilitator of uh, the proxies within the middle east from lebanon uh, syria then iraq and then yemen and yemen is a huge threat for uh, sort of uh, saudi arabia if iran keeps on financing or supporting yemen then of course is a constant threat for saudi arabia can we say that, that this is a bigger sort of uh, you know a threat for saudi arabia rather than uh, the nukes uh, brother certainly certainly it's not from today brother since the houthis has toppled a legitimate regime in yemen iran is keep on supporting yemen with ballistic missile with long range missile and you have seen those missile are being shot against oil facility so we kept on restrain but now it is about time for united states to pressurize iran because iran uh, united states now is in a difficult situation you have to understand the geopolitics the president coming to the region with a request to increase the oil production at the same time we are having issues in the region where the biden administration should inter- interfere and find solution so yeah. it's a different geopolitics it is different uh, power game it is different repositioning and it is a game changer Right. Yeah, uh, uh, Professor Scott, Professor Scott, I'll come towards you. Uh, as we we are talking about, obviously increasing the uh, you know oil production, can we say that that this deal, if it goes through well, it can pave a way for uh, a Iran as well, and eventually we might see that the Western powers require from Iran to increase their production as well to meet the uh, energy challenges of the world. And sir, can you help us uh, walk through uh, this very simple equation that might have led uh, President Biden to first actually go to the Middle East, the Arab countries, rather than trying to doubling down on the possibility of negotiations with Iran? Because Iran also has oil, and we are talking about an energy yeah. crisis right now. Is it uh, because of the muscle memory or something else? Mm-hmm. No, I mean, the United States would like a nuclear deal. The Europeans would like a nuclear deal. Russia and China would like a nuclear deal. All of them would like a nuclear deal. But first, you've got to have the issue as to whether Iran, in a sense, will come back into compliance with the agreement, as well as the Americans coming back in and lifting the sanctions. But there's a wider issue here that I think you're getting into, and that is taking the nuclear deal off the table leaves all the other issues. Saudi Arabia doesn't want a nuclear deal because of those other issues right now. And I think the one problem for Saudi Arabia right now, which has to do with Iran and with the United States and with the world, is Yemen. Saudi Arabia has gotten itself bogged down, even trapped in Yemen. We know the Iranians are supporting the Houthis, of course, but the Saudi massive military intervention has not provided a stable government. It has not provided a stable country, and it has killed tens of thousands of civilians. And what Biden will probably tell the Saudis is, is look, in exchange for working with you over Iran, in exchange for working with you over the region, as well as with Israel, we need you to start to find a way to get out of Yemen. We need you to do that for us. And I think the Saudis are are kind of stuck as to how they're going to respond to that. So nuclear agreement, if it doesn't happen right now, everything is in turmoil, but the Saudis benefit. If the nuclear deal happens, then we have all those wider regional issues 
And that means the Saudis, as well as the Americans, will face some difficult choices about the, where the Iranians are still involved in the Middle East. Mm. Right. right. So, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Scott, I right. uh, just want to clarify one thing. Does that, does that mean that the, the uh, uh, speaking of Saudi Arabia or the U.S. are not really actively seeking a resolution or a move back to the Iranian nuclear deal at the moment because it doesn't favor them? And, sir, uh, also uh, clarify which nuclear deal are you talking yes. about? Are you talking about JCPOA? Or are you talking about the uh, half, uh, uh, you know, written deal that uh, uh, the Trump administration was working on? It seems that the latter might have support of both Israel and the Arab countries. No, I mean, the Trump administration simply didn't want any type of deal. Let's push them to the side. Let's talk about the realities of where we are in the, the nuclear talks. Negotiations are going on. Yeah, I, yeah, the realities are right now in terms of where we are is that the Biden administration says to the Iranians, We'll come back into the nuclear deal. We'll lift the sanctions. You've got to stop nuclear enrichment beyond three and a half percent. You've got to stop enriching to 20 percent to 60 percent. You've got to give up that uranium. And we were close to an agreement on those terms until the start of this year. And then there was an issue, an issue which was thrown into the talks. And that is the Trump administration, I think in a very stupid move, had declared the Revolutionary Guards to be a, quote, foreign terrorist organization. Yeah. Yeah. The Iranians exactly. introduced that and said, we want you to lift that designation. Now, here's the problem. The Americans, the Europeans, even to an extent the Russians and the Chinese are concerned about the Revolutionary Guards destabilizing the Middle East. They've done it in Syria. They've done it in Libya. Or sorry, in uh, Lebanon. They've done it in Yemen. They've done it in Iraq. So. The Iranians are not going to get the Americans just to simply lift that designation without saying, OK, we're either going to not talk about the Revolutionary Guards, we're going to put that issue aside, or they're going to have to make some type of commitment to change their approach to the Middle East, neither of which they're prepared to do at this point, although they may be willing to do so if the economy runs into further trouble later this year. Yeah. Uh, Brother Fahim, uh, if we talk about, you know, uh, Israeli Prime Minister, uh, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Lapid, uh, he seeks a sort of a credible military threat against Iran. When we talk about the credible military threat against Iran, it means someone from the Gulf countries it would be part of it. Can we say that the allied forces which are, uh, you know, already uh, helping out uh, uh, the Saudi Arabia in terms of uh, Houthi rebels, you know, against them. Can we say that they can be part of it as well? And what role Saudi Arabia would be playing in that creating that credible military threat against Iran, number one? And number two, if that credible military threat is created against Iran, of course, Iran would be seeking for a deterrence and for uh, creating a sort of deterrence against all of these countries that would be involved in a credible military threat, will they be high, you know, uh, increasing their efforts to uh, finance all of uh, the uh, proxies in the region? And Mr. Fame, if you could confirm or deny what Professor Scott was talking about in terms of Saudi Arabia not really considering the Iranian nuclear deal in its favor. Mr. Fahim? Unfortunately, I don't think I Mr. Think Fahim is with us at the moment, uh, but we'll try and establish our contact I, once no, again. No, I, I think we can shift the same question. Um, we'll come Professor back to Scott. that, Faisal, uh, in just a bit. Um, but Farooq, I wanted to also take your yeah. opinion in, mm. in terms of what we've discussed so far, um, and also mm -hmm. whether or not when we talk about the Iranian nuclear deal, um, whether there's any serious actions being taken to move towards it because the kind of statements that have come out or what we're discussing seems to be going in a, a completely different direction and how all of this is eventually going to impact Pakistan's relationships with Iran, US and Saudi Arabia. Right. Uh, we'll come to uh, the second part yes. later. But regarding the importance of what is going on, I think at this moment one has to empathize uh, with uh, the Biden administration. Why? Because they are facing impossible choices everywhere. Uh, for example, because of Ukraine, the economic situation all over the world is worsening, and uh, he has to, uh, uh, President Biden has to ensure, uh, uh, see, there is also a midterm coming, right? So he has to ensure that the prices of gasoline actually co come down, and he has to negotiate with whosoever is there, uh, whosoever is the prospective, uh, you know, seller 
Hmm. And that, that means negotiating with OPEC plus, and because uh, even Russia has a cloud there, uh, so he has to actually talk to the Saudis, right? That has happened already. Regarding the negotiations with Iran, uh, I tell you one thing, there's something very interesting. In the Western media, Western media particularly, the hawks in it, keep on blaming Democrats uh, for uh, fattening or helping Iran. But uh, remember, there are um, teen books written on how Obama administration actually dealt with Iran. Mm. For example, David Sanger's book, Confront and Conceal, documents meticulously how President Obama was involved in the creation of those viruses, computer viruses, that would actually shut down Iranian nuclear uh, plants, right? That kept on happening for quite some time. Similarly, uh, when you talk about Israel, Ronan Bergman has written a book called The Secret War with Iran, 30 years, right? Uh, but that actually tells you how Iran has been playing, uh, you know, fighting a covert war, uh, sorry, uh, Israel, Israel is fighting yeah. a covert war uh, in Iran as well. And we saw that machine guns actually start activating themselves and kill people over there uh, robotically, right, controlled. Yeah. So in that situation, I think th this is uh, a kind of dance where you have to negotiate and where then you also have to push back as well. At this moment, what is changing the situation is uh, the perception in Iran, one, Iran has had a regime change, a government has changed, and uh, uh, hawks have actually taken over. The second thing is that uh, they have this perception that the uh, global atmospherics are more benign towards their acceptance, right? Mm -hmm. So in that situation, they are going to play hardball, but uh, eventually there will have to be some kind of negotiation, and I agree with Professor Lucas, it is important that there should be some agreement, right? Uh, but uh, regarding the state of affairs, earlier you asked whether there can be, and uh, my brother here was talking about credible uh, military threat. Hmm. Let me actually uh, remind you mm. of uh, Trump administration's time when Netanyahu was being forcibly removed from power. At that time, there w it was uh, thought to be a certainty that uh, Netanyahu is going to start a war. He did eventually start a war in Gaza, mm. not a, with Iran, but there was a serious possibility. But there are checks and balances that even then we didn't have any fight. Mm. And similarly, uh, remember that day when Trump uh, seemed to actually be ready to bomb Iran uh, because of uh, uh, TIF and, uh, you know, uh, because they had actually killed their uh, Iranian leader and there was a retaliation as well and then a plane went down as well in that state as well, it seems certain that there is going to be a war, but there mm. wasn't. Mm. So okay. at this moment, what I can say is very simple fact is that, uh, uh, you know, checks and balances are going to play in. At this moment in Israel, there is a moderate government. It is not Bibi Netanyahu's government. And because of that, although they are going to elections, and that's why they are going to be posturing uh, in a hawkish manner, but uh, still, I don't think there's going to be any war. In that situation, eventually, it is the US which will have to actually convince all partners that they have to find a way to work together, right. including Iran. Iran might be a distant uh, enemy, but they there is a potential to work together. Right. Regarding Pakistan, there will be pressure from all sides to pick and choose, but uh, like mm. India, keeps on saying that it uh, wants to go for strategic sovereignty. Eventually, Pakistan will have to say that we want to work with everybody. If yeah. we can do it with China and the US, we'll have to do the same with Iran, Iran and Saudi Arabia as well. And one has to actually find a way to disconnect a very important nexus that is between Israel and India. So uh, you'll have to find a way to do something about that as well. All right. Um, Faisal, if you take your question to Professor yeah. Scott. Professor, Professor Scott, uh, you know, I was asking uh, uh, earlier uh, to Brother Fahim. Obviously, he left early and he couldn't uh, reply us. I just wanted to ask. I tried to reply, but he is not satisfied. I'm not satisfied He's because I, my, my question is related to whether, uh, you know, this credible military threat, it will be uh, posed to Iran from within Middle East, or what kind of contribution Saudi Arabia would be playing against Iran for creating this credible uh, military threat? And c could we see in coming days Islamic military coalition to counter terrorism?
can play a key role in it? The, the situation of Saudi Arabia regarding Iran, and this is going to sound a bit strange, is on the direct issue, just stay out of the way. And yeah. by that, I mean the risk, which is always there for Americans and indeed for others, is that you have some type of Arab-Israeli conflict, which yeah. takes us away from issues such as looking at Iran. And what you've had is not only from the Biden administration, but from the Trump administration, um, and indeed Obama administration was, look, let's bring the Arab countries and Israel together so we take that Arab-Israel conflict off the table. And by and large, they've been successful, or at least that has happened. I think it's happened because of the countries in the region rather than being U.S.-led, but it's happened. In addition, when I say, look, Saudi Arabia stayed to the side of this, it was very important that Saudi Arabia and the UAE lift their blockade on Qatar because that was a very poisonous break within the Gulf states which is now not being completely overcome, but it's been eased. Now, if you don't have the Arab-Israeli conflict, if you have Israel, in fact, working with Saudi Arabia and the UAE, then you can leave it to uh, the European powers, you can leave it to the Americans, you can leave it to the Israelis in different ways and in different steps to contain Iran. So for the Saudi Arabians, stay out of the way, don't oppose what we're doing here, and help us out with oil. That's the fundamental that we're talking about. But let me tell you who are the losers in this that we haven't really talked about that much when we focus on it. First of all, it's political prisoners in Saudi Arabia. Those issues are now not going to be addressed. That's gone. Exactly. Mohammed bin Salman, who we remember detained other members of the royal family to seize power or consolidate power, he has succeeded there. Secondly, the family of Jamal Khashoggi, because there will be no accountability now for his assassination. And thirdly, the Palestinian people, yeah. because no one cares. And I know what our Saudi friends said. They don't care about Palestine in terms of getting credible Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. No one cares at this point, not even the Americans. And fourthly, the people of Yemen, because while Saudi Arabia may be under pressure to pull out of Yemen, especially right. because a lot of people in Washington, including in Congress, don't like what the Saudis are doing there, Nobody's going to really force them into accepting a political settlement at right. this point. Uh, Dr. Lucas, uh, let us come back to the Iranian question because it was an interesting question. Do you think that this Islamic uh, uh, coalition actually has the prowess to uh, take on uh, Iran for that matter? Because we have seen that what was happening in Yemen, the operations were not that great or that successful. Yeah, I, I, again, I think you're right. If we were talking about some type of protracted military conflict, you know, we've seen it in Iraq, we've seen it in Lebanon, we've seen it in Yemen, we've seen it in Syria. Nobody wins in those conflicts. Yeah. Nobody. But where the competition here, if you think about this in terms of a competition, is it's on the political and the economic fronts. And a lot of the appeal of Israel cooperating with Saudi Arabia and with the UAE and with Bahrain is the idea of everyone's going to economically benefit. You guys have studied the Cold War. You know that in the end, one of the big messages of the Cold War was not that we'll defeat you militarily, but we will be stronger than you economically. And if you don't work with us, you will be weak economically. That's going to be the message to Iran. Do you want to continue to be an outsider here while Israel, of all people, is getting along with the Arab states? Or do you finally start to back away from some of your hard lines? Um, right. It's not just... Yeah, and, and I think that's going to pose a very difficult choice for Tehran in the weeks to come. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Thank Scott Lucas, much. for being a part of the show. Uh, and of course, our thanks uh, to uh, Fahim Alhamid as well uh, for being a part of the debate and talking to us. That's all that we have in the debate.